fire. Welcome to Impact Discipleship. There you go. Three. All right, people. We are going to speed our way through Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 18. Uh, Last week when I divided up chapter 1, I decided the entire series was going to be called, it's going to be four parts. It's going to be called In Him, In You. And uh, part two has the subtitle of The Image of the Invisible God. And we're going to talk about why that is towards the end of these um, handful of verses. It, uh, it says that. It actually says he is the image of the invisible God, talking about Christ. And so we'll read verses 9 through 18 first, and we'll track back through them. Um, today, I put in a lot of Bible, re well, a, a number of Bible references that we won't turn to. Sometimes I put the verses in. Sometimes I choose not to put the verses in. I just reference them. So you could have a study guide when you, when you study the notes. I felt very compelled to focus on that, that one area about the image of the invisible God. And some of you have heard a teaching on this topic before. But it's so important for where we are today in the world that we're going to spend our time on that today. So, Josh, you want to go ahead and uh, read Colossians 1. 9 through 18. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all, over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thorns or powers or rulers or authorities, thrones, my bad, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased That's to have... That's it. Oh, I think... My bad, I thought I was reading through 19. Through 18. Through 18. So... You're reading what? Was that an NIV? NIV. Yeah, it was very good. I like that. Sometimes the NIV has a real good way of putting it. Some people hate the NIV. I love it. It's my and uh, it does, it does. It really, I think it really dialed in those verses. I usually read and I do my studies from the New King James Version. Um, so, what do we have here? He starts off with this statement for, uh, for this reason. It's a very interesting phrase for this reason. It's referring to uh, what came before, and he's going to give us some, some information about why. And so when we, he, he's saying, for this reason, what is the reason? We're going to do certain things. You're going to be filled with knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding, like for this reason. And, and, and we can reasonably believe what he says for this reason. He's referring to what we just learned last week. In the, in the eight verses, he gives us a reason, and he says, he's, remember, he's addressing these, Colo these, these people in, 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 of Colossae, Colosse, and he says, since we heard of your faith, or all through that first eight verses, he says, you know, you have this amazing faith, you have this amazing love, you're living in this amazing hope, you, you, are, you are attracted to the truth of the gospel, you have this fruit showing up in your life. You have the grace of God showing up in your life. That's, that's what that first section is about. For this reason. We might, we might even say, for these reasons, all these things are going on. Um, since that's going on, I'm not going to stop praying for you, or we, because it's really he and Timothy that are uh, you know, authoring this letter, uh, or the authority is coming for this letter. And, and we're not going to start praying for you 
for this thing. Here's my prayer for you. Because of how you're being, you people, I'm going to pray that you may, you're filled with all the knowledge and the wisdom and the spiritual understanding. And, and what does that mean? Like, uh, and the knowledge, well, he says the knowledge of his will is specifically the phrase, the knowledge of his will. And, and I think we would say that could be the age-old question. It might even be the question you ask yourself often when you're praying. What is God's will? What is God's will? What is God's will in general? What's God's will for mankind? What's God's will for my life? It's a great question. We could write books about that concept. Uh, but I think we want to sum it up today because, you know, uh, probably we could just stop this chapter. We could say, hey, we're going to do a whole teaching just on the will of God. That's not where we're going today. We could do it. But we'll say, if we want to sum up the understanding of what it means to get wisdom and, understa wisdom and understanding, this is what we want. His, his will is that you have wisdom and understanding. And I think if we all turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, okay, also a letter um, authored by Paul to a different city, Ephesus. It probably has the best rendition of what it means to get a spirit of wisdom and revelation of what God has. So, not so much specifically, what is God's will for my life? What should I do with my life? What's my ministry? What's my decision in a moment, which is all supposed to come under the will of God. The general, for everyone, will of God is that, as it says in Ephesians 1, 17 to 20, that you would have a revelation, a spiritual revelation, a spiritual wisdom revelation, that the eyes of your, your eyes would be opened and that you may know something. That something is probably the most important foundational thing for you to know when you're thinking about the will of God. And that's this, as he goes on to say, that you have the power inside of you, the same power that God used to raise Christ from the grave. So I was going to say, hey, listen, um, the first thing I want to leave with you generally, not specific, not a specific pastoral revelation about the will of God for your life, which again is valid and important and can be a study unto itself. I'm saying first most important thing to get revelation about for wisdom and understanding is the, is the supernatural realization of the power you have access to as a Christian. Mean. That's number one. Number two... What are you willing to do because of that? That would be, that would be number two, right? And, and I would draw that from uh, some of my favorite and shortest parables in, in the Bible, from Matthew, Matthew 13, 44 to 46. It's where he says, with the words of Yeshua himself, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, or a, a, I mean a, a merchant uh, seeking beautiful pearls. And when he had found one pearl, he sells everything he has so he can obtain it, so he can buy it. And, and, and what is that? What are those parables about? Those parables are about the fact that you will give up everything for what God has for you. Oh, me. Everything. So these two things, if I can impart to you the most important wisdom and understanding that you could have as a general rule for your life, the life of all believers, it would be that you have an understanding of the power that you have access to, the grace that you have access to, mm and that you should be willing to give up everything to walk in that. Mm -hmm. Everything. Those two things, right? And we'll leave that there. And then he gives us a list of things, some very cool things in, in verses 10 to 12. A list of things, almost like a, a checklist. I don't want you to live like they're a checklist, but I want you to see them like, wow, there's some very cool specifics. He says that you walk worthy 
fully pleasing to God, fruitful in everything you're doing, all the works, increasing in knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, patient and long-suffering. I think Josh's version said enduring. I love that. Mm -hmm. Joyful, thankful, and recognizing that it's God who qualified you. That's an important piece. Mm -hmm. That's a great piece because it keeps you from getting full of yourself, mm -hmm. like somehow I, I did this, right? So this is what it looks like for um, what God is looking for in believers, right? Like you're gonna go check. Walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, fruitful in every good work. There's a lot going on here, right? Again, this is the area where I decided not to write every cross-reference because we would have wound up with 20-something pages of notes instead of 15 or 16, I think it was 16 which I like to keep it right in that 14 to 16 page area uh, on Saturdays so we can thumb through this more quickly. Um, but we should understand the concepts. What does it mean to walk worthy? What does it mean to be fully pleasing in every good work, right? You understand, you must understand from Ephesians 2 and 1 to 10, you were saved by faith, by the institution of God's grace in your life that gave you the power to believe in the first place. And what you're supposed to do with that power um, is continue to grow in that faith and do good works, right? That's, that's what Ephesians says. That's what Romans 5, 1 to 6 says. It basically says we have hope, right? Romans says we have hope even in all the trials. We persevere through these trials and we realize that, that the outcome is going to be good because we could live in that hope. And what's empowering that entire thing? the grace in which we stand. So the grace saves us and the grace we stand in, right? That power we just talked about from Ephesians chapter one, God's power resurrected you from your dead state and continues to empower you in your living state, right? And then, um, of course, in, in, um, when we talk about uh, pleasing to him, we can't, we, can't, we can't ignore one of the best uh, statements about being pleasing to God that comes in the beginning of chapter 12 in Romans where it's talking about being transformed by the renewing of your mind and living, giving your life like a living sacrifice which is pleasing to God. And we know living sacrifice just happens to mean you give up everything for God. Mm -hmm. That's what's re And he calls that reasonable. This is your reasonable ministry to God, your reasonable give back, your reasonable response. The reasonable response for what God did for you is that you give everything back. Sacrifice everything, mm, right? Not 10%. And so, and then he says, um, when he talks about pleasing, I don't think we, I think, well, and again, we won't quote it. I mean, we won't read it, but if you go to the beginning of the book of Hebrews and it's talking about, you know, faith, the famous faith chapter in Hebrews, which is chapter 11, in the sixth verse, it says, without faith, it's impossible to be pleasing to God, right? So it's just unbelievable circle. God gives you faith to believe, by, by first changing your heart with his grace, that faith allows you to confess and believe in who Jesus is and who God is, and then you continually access that grace to empower your faith to remain pleasing to God in everything you do. It's a cycle, right? That's how, that's how God is operating, right? It goes on, another parameter here in, Col in Colossians is increasing in the knowledge of God, right? Uh, here's, the st here's something for you. You're not permitted to be stagnant in your faith. You must continue to grow and mature, and you are to mature in your faith life from born-again Christian to mature Christian, from born-again Christian to adult Christian, much like a human is born a child and grows into an adult. Probably best seen, again, I'll give you the reference, Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, those are the last few verses of Hebrews 5. Hebrews 6, the first three verses, right? I wish you would mature. I wish you would grow up. I wish you would have different attributes operating your life as a believer um, that you don't stay a child, that you mature, you turn into an adult believer, right? That's what I would say, increasing your knowledge of God, right? You have to, it's an increasing, it's a, it's a, it's a progression, right? Then it goes on to say, strengthening with all might according to his glorious power. And here we are again. 
This is to remind us that all of this is happening by God's grace. All of it's happening by His power. It's not something you do on your own strength. You have to access God's grace to do anything good in your life. You can't improve yourself or the world around you in any meaningful way outside of God's power working in you. Everything else is going to burn up like grass, right? In the process, in the process, you have to have patience. Mm -hmm. God's timeline doesn't work like our timelines. You have to have a patience and long-suffering, or as the NIV said, endurance. God's timing is everything. Even when you're doing everything right, things always remain on God's timeline. Your job is to obey, and God's job is to take care of everything else. You have to rest in that. You can't just be, well, I'm doing all this, so then. It's like, no, you could say, I'm doing all this, so then I know, but it doesn't have to happen when you think. It doesn't happen happen on your timing, right? And then he says, joy, have joy. Joy is an internal satisfaction that comes from delighting in the Lord and trusting in Him. As opposed to happiness, which is connected to external circumstances and successes. Joy is something you could have all the time. Happiness is rightfully connected to the things going on in your life. You can be joyful and unhappy at the same time. God does not guarantee happiness. He does promise joy. Hallelujah. Right? And then, of course, be thankful. Give thanks to God. We have nothing without God. Even the breath in your lungs when you woke this morning is because of Him. Thank Him at all times, even when you're going through trials. The Bible calls that the sacrifice of praise. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I love this piece, just in case, or so you don't become overly enamored with yourself. He has qualified you to be partakers in this inheritance. Okay, this is a very important thing. Never, 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 never forget that it was he who qualified us. We couldn't choose ourselves or save ourselves or anything ourselves. It's all him, and our sole assignment is to use our guaranteed inheritance to fuel and inspire the life We're living after that inheritance or because of that inheritance. What I call radical, grace-empowered, faith-based obedience to God. That always comes after. You have to be born again, filled with the Spirit, access to God's grace to to live this grace-empowered life. And God is saying, don't ever forget how you got this in the first place. Because if you do, you'll start becoming filled with yourself. And that always goes sideways. Right? Okay. Then, we won't spend a lot of time on on 13 and 14. It's more of like a reality check, reminder. Um, It's very serious what happened. He delivered us from darkness, from the power of darkness. We might even say the grace of darkness. Grace, darkness is powerful. He's delivered us from that and conveyed us into the kingdom of the sun or the kingdom of, of light, right? This is a perspective in which we're supposed to live life. When you start wanting to be woe is me and woe, blah, blah, right? All enamored with your circumstances, all looking at what's going on around you, God's like, please don't ever forget you've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness mm-hmm. and put into a new paradigm, the kingdom of the sun. Yes, Lord. And um, the spirit world is real. The dark side is as real as the light side. And you've been delivered from the dark side, and you need to live in the light side. Mm -hmm. So this is all a reminder. Then, in verse 15, we're going to spend most of the rest of our study, and we'll speed through the last few verses. This is the part that that inspired the the subtitle for today. And and I really have to reiterate this, uh, both for you present, for the camera. Uh, I don't think I could say this enough even on and off camera, in the world that we live in today, this you know, maybe should be a verse that you lock into your toolbox forever. He is the image. Who are we talking about here? Christ. Yeshua is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, this is a mind-twisting concept. As we'll see, as he, as he tracks through in this chapter, we're going to see 
in the next verse that he's the one that's there at creation creating all things. So he's the create he is the he is the image of that very thing. The creation itself. And it says and so here's the thing, the most important issue of today, the most single most important issue of today in the earth, I don't mean in the United States, I don't mean politically, I mean the single most important issue that we can address in the earth today is that we either submit to the idea that there is one God, one image of one God and only one God, or we don't. Those are your two sides. You can't have it both ways. You can't have another God. You can't have multiple gods. You can't have, um, it's okay for you to have your God and I have my God. The, the true God left no room for that. No tolerance for that. Because he said, this is my image. Right in the beginning of the Bible just 26 verses into the beginning of the Holy Writ, he says, in verse 26, Genesis 1, then God said, let us, us, let us make man in our, our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and the birds and all the creeping things. So, because I want to make Man, in our image, he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the whole of creation. That's Genesis 1, 26 to 28. God, who is one, catch this, describes himself as an us. We know that to be the Father, Spirit, Son. He makes man in the likeness of the image of an us. He creates Adam as a one, like God is a one. He creates Adam. He says, I created him with the image of an us. Male and female, he created them. And then he tells him, to be fruitful and multiply, multiply, make a child. And notice in this moment, key in this moment, Eve doesn't exist when this command is given. The image of God, the Father, Spirit, and Son, is a man in Adam, a male, a female, and child. And if you were standing there, the interaction would look like a one being creating one man. The observer would see Adam, but he would see no woman or child. That's the image of God. You have to lock that into your brain. That explains the Trinity. That explains humanity. That explains how God has distinguished himself. The God, the single God in the earth, has distinguished himself from every other God you might name, who are not gods at all. So how can we make this visible God Make this, make this visible. How can we make what God is describing that we can't see visible? How do we do it? How does God do it? It's very simple. In the next chapter, in the 18th verse, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. Now, in this moment, if God were to take something from the outside to make this helper, it would disrupt the entire thing we just learned about the image of God. He doesn't do that. He takes Adam, the him, who he said was a them, and he extracts the DNA out of Adam in the form of a rib, and he forms that rib into a woman. This is verse 2, 21 to 22. And then he brings, important, he presents this woman to Adam. See, Adam looks alone. He looks soul. He looks like one. And God says, no, you need to see what was inside of Adam. He takes the, takes the rib out and he puts, he takes the rib out and he takes that rib, forms a woman 
and most importantly, shows the woman to the man. Look. Look right here. Adam, you're an us, but it looks like you're alone. It's not good for you to think you're alone. I, I extract the woman out, make her visible from the inside to the outside, and present her so he could see it, and more importantly, we could see it. The whole world could see it. it now, it wasn't meant that you were supposed to see her on the outside and think she was separate from Adam. Because Adam is an us. God is an us. The image of God is man, who's an us, and because he extracted this woman, and he doesn't want you to think they're supposed to be separate, he had to ensure that this created image of God in man could still remain a one. And how did he do that? Marriage. Right after that, in verse 23 to 25 in chapter 2, he says, this is now, Adam says it. This is, Adam realizes, this is not separate from me. This is one with me. This came from me. Watch what he says. This is now, this is what Adam says, not God. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. And then she go on a honeymoon. They were both naked. That's what it says next. And they were both naked. Genesis 23, Genesis 2, 23 to 25. Now, you want to see the most magnificent like display and, 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 and you want to seal this understanding, it says, Yeshua said this, about, that, about this whole thing, about what we just read in Genesis 1, about what we just read in Genesis 2. This is what Yeshua, who is what? The image of the invisible God, Yeshua, says this. Have you not read, by the way, meaning, go to the Bible and find this, Right? This is Matthew 19, by the way, 4 to 6. Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning, by the way, that's me. You might as well say, I did that. Made them male and female. And he made them male and female. How did he make them male and female? Well, well, I created Adam as a male and female, but we couldn't see the female, so I extracted Eve out of Adam and showed her to him and the rest of the world. Then he says, you got to lock this phrase, almost sounds like we started this whole chapter, for this reason, uh, that's how we started chapter, this section, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother be joined together, uh, uh, joined as his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then he adds this explanation point, well, well, no, we finish. So then they are no longer two but one flesh, right? So he's, he's reiterating this entire reason that a man was, that, that, that a, a woman uh, is married to a man is so that we can remember they were always supposed to be one. And here's the thing about that one. If you try to divide that one, you ruin the image of God. Man who tries to divide that one ruins the image of God. So not in Genesis, not quoting from Genesis, Yeshua inserts this phrase, so that what God has joined together, let no man separate. What God has created as his image, let no one pervert, let no one ruin. Right? Because man was always meant to be one, the image of God. This is the reason we have marriage. Can you see how critical marriage is? Can you see why the assault on marriage and the family today is a direct assault on the image of God being only one God? There's only one. There's no other. You can't add another. You can't substitute another. There's no other name, there's no other story, there's one. We have to remain steadfast and intolerant to anything other than that. 
That's why Yeshua said, have you not read that he made them in the beginning male and female? And have not you, in a, am I not inserting now those who uh, man can't, can't, what God has brought together, what God intended to be one in marriage, no one should violate. And that's why in this chapter, he says, this is the image, he is the image, Yeshua is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Why? Because in him is the image of God. Now we know today, if you looked at Yeshua, you would see a male. But inside every human male is male and female DNA. Now you think that Moses knew that when he was writing this story down? No. But if you were going to build a female, you have to start with a male. Right? Well, you can build a female from a female or a male, but you can't build a male from a female. So if all we had was females, we can never have a male. Why? Because females only have female DNA. A man has male and female DNA, so if you want to make a woman, you could extract the woman DNA in the rib, in the, in the matrix of a man, and you could create a woman out of it. But you can't create a man out of a woman. And that's in the Bible. Before any genetic testing, before any way we could discover DNA or know any of this stuff, right? So, the, the Genesis story kind of ends for our purposes today in, in chapter 4, where the final piece of this trinity comes together, and it's when Adam and Eve, in their human form, and as a married couple, conceive and bear their first child, Cain. And this is what Eve prophetically says about Cain. I have acquired a man from the Lord. She was like, hey, I got knocked up by my husband and we had a baby. That's not her perspective. <laughs> the pregnant woman has participated in propagating the image of God in the earth. And that's why they want to abort all the babies. See, so we have the assault on marriage and we have the assault on the birth of children. <laughs> and we have the assault on the identification of male and female in the first place. That's why this is the most important, important, important message for the day. So when God says, I created man in my own image, male and female, I created them, how can you, if you're a strategist, how can you destroy the image of the one God who says there's one way to identify me any better than destroying these three things? The identity of a male and female, the importance of marriage and what it represents, and the life of a child in the womb. That's what destroys the image of God. And if we turn our Bibles... Let's read this out loud. We'll take our time to read this and then I'll break it down. Turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We'll skip ahead to the 18th verse for time's sake to, 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 um, to emphasize. Josh, do you have that remote? Let's let a young person read. How about Delena? Let's let Delena read. You got that? Let's start in... Keep going. Talking. All right. Sure it's on. Hello? Do you see it? Is it, is it yeah. making noise? I see it. Okay, great. Okay. So we're going to read the 18th to the 32nd verse for those either following along for those following along, um, I want you to just meditate on these words. Don't worry too much about understanding every detail. We're going to track back through these, and I'm going to explain every piece about how this is the strategy of the enemy in the earth today. This is exactly what's going on. <coughs> Starting in verse 18. Chapter 18, Romans 1. Romans 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people 
who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts and to sexual impurity to the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served, created the things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Keep going. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to depraved minds so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and dep depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteousness, righteousness, or sorry, they know God's righteous degree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Whoa! It's Boom. almost like we could say without commentary how descriptive of everything I just warned you against Paul is writing about. But I, I do want to break it down because it's very, very important. I'll say this. Very often, when, when, uh, when Christians study Romans chapter 1, and they talk about uh, creation testifying to who God is, they, they're looking at nature. Again, I would not say that's an incorrect concept, looking around and seeing the order of things and the universe and the beauty and, and things that are unexplainable other than being, there being a higher power, right? So nature itself testifies to the fact that God exists. But nature itself can only testify that there's a, an intelligent design and, and an intelligent designer, but it doesn't testify who that is. If you take Romans 1 and you just want to use nature as we're seeing it as proof that there's a, a higher power, proof that there's a God, you're missing the bigger point, right? First of all, we're going to say this. God is furious, furious against those who twist with what he's about to say who twist the truth. He's, a, he's, a, he's furious with it, who suppress the truth. He says all men should know who God is because he showed it to the world by how he created man in his own image. That his image is inside of man. At creation, he made him, man, in his image. Male and female, he created them. And those invisible attributes... The woman and the child inside of Adam, he made visible so no one would have doubts. You see, it was, the, it was the making the woman and the child visible that testifies to who God is. Not nature, not trees and birds and the beauty. Yes, but that's not specific. It's the fact that God said, I made man in my image. And then inside a man is a man, a woman, and a child. And you could not see the man, woman, and child unless God made them visible. He did this to show the nature of the Godhead. Father, Spirit, Son. So humans, to be the image of God, they had to have three parts. Man, woman, 
child, the image of God. And when man knows this, and he must by definition know this because he can view in the earth man, woman, child, and he denies this, he's robbing the one God of his glory. If you do that, God will give you over to your unprofitable, useless, and foolish thinking and allow your hearts to become dark. Is that not what you are seeing in the world today? Eventually, God gives them over to complete identity confusion. Men and women confusing sexual identity because they were committed to denying the truth and embracing the lie. You are watching it today. Then he says, for this reason, oh, there's that phrase again. <laughs> for this reason, God gives them up to the vile passions of homosexual lust and the consequences that come with the arrogant belief that that's true. The arrogant denial of the very image of God. See, the opposite we just heard when Jesus said, for this reason, God created them male and female. Male and female, he created them. For this reason, God made them get married so that we would know there was still one fresh. For this reason, what man what God has created, no man should pervert. For that reason, this is the reason he did it. And God says, for the reason that they deny it, I'm giving them over to this, this debauchery. I'm going to give it over to them. That's why in that long list of sins you maim, the first one is sexual identity confusion. That's why the long list, that's why the long list starts with the very thing that denies the image of God. Because once you do that, everything else is, is, free, game. is free game. Exactly. You want to say something? Mm -hmm. So I guess you can say the only they, them, that is one. Is, is God. A, is a married <laughs> couple. <Yes. laughs> okay. So then we're going to finish up. Yeah, that's funny. So then we'll finish up, right? So you, you guys get that. Did that lock in? Do you see... Do you see how important it is? He goes on to say in verse 16 and 17, this is back in Colossians where um, Paul is writing, for by him, talking about Christ, Yeshua, all things were created. See, he, Christ is saying, uh, I did all this, right? That are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, and principalities. And powers, all things were created through him and by him. And he is before all things, and in all things, um, and in him all things, things can, uh, and, and, and in him all things consist. Meaning, Christ is the depiction of God. And at creation, he was the one creating everything. And he's saying, you're made in my image. We, we're going to, this, this is who you are as a human. See? So Christianity is not just another world religion that you can latch on to and say, oh, I'm going to put that in my, I'm going to put that in my religion toolbox. A mm -hmm. little bit of Jesus, great master, a little bit of Buddha, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. No. It's singular. It's defining. It's intolerant. Not intolerant of people. We love people, but we can't tolerate lies. So when someone's out there trying to tell you gender and sex and this and that, it's like, it's, 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 it's utter insanity. You realize there's no reasoning because there's no reason. They've been given over to a darkened heart, futile thoughts in a debased mind. They have reasoned that there's no such thing as a man, no such thing as a woman, Marriage is not anything special, and that, that unborn child, the fruit of marriage, has no right to live. That's what they've created, right? And then the last verse for, for today, it says, and he is the head. So now he brings it back into governance of the church. He's the head of the church. He's the firstborn from the dead. He may have, that, that he have all preeminence, right? We learned even last night in our study 
called going on the offensive in our Friday night study. We, 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 we again reiterated like we did last week, right? We spent some time in the division of the church and, and how it's structured with the apostle and the prophet and Jesus as the chief cornerstone from Ephesians chapter 2. And, but he's the chief cornerstone. He's the head. He's the, he's the model. He's the, what we're following. He's the firstborn, as it's just, you know, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He's the firstborn. He's the first fruits of all creation. Right? And we know from, from Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 23, that we are the church of the firstborn. You see, the whole thing is that we are, are heirs, like it says in, in Romans 8, we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. We, we take on the image of Christ by becoming Christians. Therefore, we are, we, are, um, we are the representation. He's talking about himself as he talks about us. So anyone who could say, I'm a Christian, but deny the image of God by denying a woman is a woman, a man is a man, that a child has a right to live, or that marriage is between a man and a woman to unify a man and a woman as one flesh in the image of God so they can co-create and make a child, anybody who denies that, by definition, can't be a Christian. Although they can call themselves Christians. They just can't be. Now, you can have error, you can have prevailing sin, you can be confused, but when you have abject denial vehement denial, aggressive denial, fighting. Oh, that's not what the Bible really says. You start doing that, you're just, you're just not a Christian. And that's not a judgment. Listen, everybody that needs to be, have a born-again experience so God can start working on their hearts and so on and so forth. So I hope that like locks some things in. That's where we're going to end today. Next week, we're going to handle the next section. It's, uh, again, In Him, In You, Part 3. We'll, we'll handle 19 to 23, and it'll be, the subtitle will be Preached to Every Creature Under Heaven. Yeah, where's this 